And I also would like to say that I've been an investigator for a little over 20 years now. And investigations, especially in this climate today, of fake news and obscuring facts, of deception and disruption, investigation becomes ever more important to find the facts and weed through the bias and corruption. So all of you are the heroes because you bring those facts to light. And that's ever more important today. And like John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. So finding them is not always easy. But I want to start with a story. And the story takes place a little while ago in the year 2001 on a cold February morning, which is not easy to imagine uh, today in Nashville. Robert Hansen has the best day of his life. He wakes up, he has brunch with his children and his grandchildren. They go to church together. His best friend is in town from Germany visiting that he grew up with. He plays frisbee with his pal and his dog out in his backyard. And near the end of that day, that perfect day, he gets in the car to take his buddy to the airport, Dulles Airport in Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. And on the way home, in his neighborhood, he stops at a little park called Foxstone Park in Vienna, Virginia. He parks his car right outside the park, and he follows a well-trod footpath into the very center of the park. Now, like I've said, it's February in D.C., so autumn has already stolen the leaves from the trees. It's cold, and his breath, breath is frosting in front of his face. And he can see all around him through those sparse trees. And he knows he's alone. And he gets to the small footbridge in the center of the park, and he stands on it. He looks around him to make sure he's comfortable one last time. And when he feels that he's alone, he reaches into his sport coat, and he pulls forth a package. It's about yay big. It's wrapped in plastic and packing tape so it's protected from the elements. And then he steps off that bridge, and he clambers under it, which is not an easy thing to do when you're about six foot four. And he slides that package into the superstructure, where it'll be safe from children at play or the casual jogger going by. Climbs back up on the bridge, knocks the dirt off his shoes, and smiles to himself. For he has just loaded his final drop to the Russians, his final drop of highly classified information after 22 years of spying for a foreign intelligence service. One of the longest shelf lives for a spy in history. Think about that for a second. 22 years as a spy. So Robert Hansen spied not just for the Russians, but for the Soviet Union and survived the collapse of the Soviet Union and the reformation into the Russian Federation. That was a time when old KGB intelligence officers who were suddenly out of a job weren't going to beat their swords into plowshares and go work a farm somewhere. They stole secrets. They raided file cabinets. Remember those? And they sold those secrets to the highest bidder, which often was the FBI. And so in the earlier part of my career, in the uh, mid-90s, we were catching all these Cold War spies like Earl Pitts and Aldrich Ames and Jim Nicholson, but we never caught Robert Hansen because he was clever in the way he spied. Some of the things he did, just to set the stage here, he gave up information regarding our nuclear arsenal. Think about what everybody wanted during the time of the Cold War. Obviously, we wanted to know uh, what would happen during a catastrophic attack, and so did the Soviet Union. And he gave up where our missiles would fly and where we'd fire them from and what our plan was and what our contingency for government plan was in case of a catastrophic, uh, catastrophic event. So where do we send the president and vice president and the cabinet and everybody else who matters in politics, or depending on your politics, doesn't matter, if there is a catastrophic event? Bad stuff. But he also gave up undercover operations. 
the names of people working undercover, our ways and means and how we protect ourselves here in the United States, our counterintelligence. He gave up people like me, ghosts who work undercover full time, following targets, and I could tell you what you ate for breakfast, met for who you met for lunch, and what you did before you went to sleep at night, and how much you snored by the end of the day. And if people like that can't operate, then spies and terrorists can within our country. And he also gave up because, and among many other things, but I'm not going to spend my entire keynote on that, he also gave up, and here is where truth is stranger than fiction, he gave up a tunnel that we, we had bored under the Russian embassy on Tunla Road in Washington, D.C. Think about that for a second. We built a tunnel under their embassy and put a listening post there so we could hear everything they were saying. Yeah, we did. And imagine the fact that Hansen told them, even before the tunnel was finished, that we had done this. So what can they do? Here's your spy 101 test. Well, follow along with me here. And if you can follow along, then maybe you can be a new spy. If they know that we don't know, that they know that we've got a secret tunnel and are listening to everything, what can they do? False information, misinformation, everything we were learning from this amazing objective in espionage and counter espionage was all a waste. In fact, it was hurting us. So he was a bad guy. He gave up an enormous amount of information. But what else did he do? Well, one thing you have to understand about Robert Hansen, and what you might ask, be asking yourself, Eric, I thought we were going to hear about cybersecurity. Love the spy story. Is the fact that Robert Hansen was our first cyber spy. The reason that he was so successful for 22 years and the FBI wasn't able to catch him, we weren't even looking for him in the FBI, was because of how he stole information. He stole information from databases. He stole information from being put on task forces with other agencies and stole it from them so that we were never looking at ourselves at the FBI. We were looking at the CIA and the NSA and other alphabet agencies and not ourselves. And he did it in a way that was new. He stole information in the form of data. And this is back in the day when a lot of FBI agents were still handwriting all of their logs and memos. And he, of course, was stealing what we had put into databases. Remember those things called file cabinets? They're all gone now. We have moved from a paper-based system, I mean, preaching to the choir here, to an electronic system. Hansen was one of the first spies to drop floppy disks, remember those, to his Russian handlers. Remember the five and a quarter ones? I, I bring everybody back during this stuff. Yeah, I, I think the, when the Russians first received these in a drop, they probably put it on one of those old 45 record players and tried to play it and was like, I don't know why it's not working, right? And he had to explain, no, no, you put it in a computer and you uh, decrypt it. They were like, what's that? He had to explain that to them. And of course, then he moved on to the uh, three and a half more sturdy floppy disks, and we caught him before he could go to thumb drives. Um, like Edward Snowden, of course, picked up that one. And it is part of this, this need for data, this need to express ourselves, to communicate, to share information more rapidly and efficiency, efficiently that we have created an Achilles heel for ourselves. So think about it. We're not going to be happy in our society until I can think to you and you get that thought and it's that instant. Here's the problem. What is the number one way that we communicate today in business? It's email. But sometimes I speak to a crowd of millennials and they're just texting. Nope, that's close. It's emails. We are more likely to send an email communication in a business setting than we are to pick up the phone and call someone. In fact, I guarantee you, the last time you got a phone call in your office or even in your home and you looked at the number on caller ID and you didn't recognize it, you probably scowled at your phone. You gave your phone a dirty look. How dare someone call me? Couldn't they just send me an email? Because it's convenient, it's efficient, but it's also unsecure and it's impersonal. 
And that is the Achilles heel of email communication. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. My daughter, right, I catch, I, I, she has a cell phone. She's nine years old. It's, it has no connection. I didn't give a nine-year-old a functional cell phone. It, it only works when she's in our house. And I'm a cybersecurity expert, so it's locked down, believe me. And she can text the approved list, myself, my wife, her best friend, and a few aunts and uncles, and grandpa. Right? That's it. So she's texting, and I look over her shoulder. And I, uh, I see she's texting her best friend. Approved list? Okay. And I ask her, well, Honey, is your, is your buddy out of town? Who, where is she right now? She's texting. She goes, no, she's home. All right, watch this. If I start here and I walk across the stage, I've just walked from my backyard to our neighbor's backyard where her best friend lives. <laughs> and she's texting her. Why? Because she couldn't go have a personal communication with her, right? She, instead of picking up the phone and calling or having a face-to-face -face meeting, she sent a text. It's like sending an email. And that impersonal communication is the root of every cyber attack since Sony was attacked in 2014. Fooling people, defrauding people, socially engineering people using an impersonal communication called an email. Because I can trick you if I'm a spy, if I'm a fraudster, if I'm a hacker, by sending you an email. One of the most important lessons that I can leave with you today is this. There are no hackers. Let that sink in with this great echo you're hearing. There are no hackers. There are only spies. Hacking is nothing more than the necessary evolution of espionage. As we took our information out of file cabinets and we put it into databases, and then because we wanted to communicate quickly, we hooked those databases up to the internet, the most flawed, by the way, system of communication in terms of security, we exposed ourselves to a new wave of espionage. Those old GRU guys, Russian military intelligence that used to hang around DC bars waiting for people with government badges to go get their afternoon drinks or um, hit the bar at, in the evening and would try to recruit them so that they would go back into their agencies and businesses and carry the secrets out in paper, sometimes stuffed down their pants. They are now cyber attackers, trained in cyber espionage, sending phishing emails, trying to get people to click on links. It is the new way that espionage works. Why do I need to sit down and spend a huge amount of time recruiting you when I can send you an email and virtually recruit you? Steal your credentials, become you within your company's network, and then do what I want. I make you into the bad guy and you never even knew it. So there are no hackers, there are only spies, and it's been this way for quite some time. In 2014, Sony was attacked. And if you remember, Sony was attacked by a group called the Guardians of Peace, right? Great name for attackers, I guess, because it shows you that uh, foreign intelligence services do have a sense of humor. Because the Guardians of Peace, that was what they called themselves, GOP, maybe that was a little play on words too. When the Sony employees got in one morning in their Culver City offices, they see on every computer screen a grinning red skull with skeletal hands reaching out, and it says that you have been locked. You have been hacked. They were unable to get into any of their systems, and what Sony did was something which actually turns out to be very smart. They shut everything down, every network, and they conducted forensics. And they found out that 50 different networks all the way from Culver City in California up into the UK had been compromised. That's thousands of computer systems. Compromised not just by attackers who stole information and put it in a pastebin account, including emails, corporate emails, for everyone in the world to read, every journalist, uh, you know, making their careers reading these emails. They also left behind these cyber bombs, is the best way to explain them, where when they detonated, they would erase every single bit of data on the computers. 
This wasn't just to steal information and embarrass Sony, it was revenge. The FBI investigated and was um, almost 100% certain that this was North Korea who launched these attacks. One of the things that made them certain was that at the same time Sony was being attacked, South Korea was being attacked. 140,000 different computers over uh, within 160 agencies and businesses who were loaded with the same cyber bombs had, had they detonated, would have, would have taken down South Korea's physical infrastructure. They caught it in time, and so did Sony, uh, but it would have been devastating. And of course, if we remember that movie, The Interview, that may have been what was behind this attack, because when you have a movie where two really dumb people somehow managed to kill the uh, tyrannical, evil leader of a, uh, a dictator-led country, then uh, that dictator, who also has two to th 3,000 reported hackers working for him, will get revenge. And that's what he did to Sony, apparently. We think, we're pretty sure. Attribution is always hard in cybersecurity, but I think we be pretty sure that he was mad that he got killed in a fictitious movie and so went after the studio that made it. So fast forward a few years, right? That's Sony in 2014. And there was this little thing that happened last year where we had an election, some of you might remember it. Um, I don't think that uh, the news or anyone is going to let us forget. And the, uh, the DNC and the chairman of Hillary Clinton's campaign are attacked, right? So John Podesta, who's uh, Hillary's campaign chairperson, um, chairman, who is the most her of the with her of her people, on a Sunday morning gets an email. It's from Gmail. It comes um, really late Saturday night. He gets it when he wakes up in the morning on Sunday. He's, you know, having his coffee and looking through his email on his phone. And he sees an, an email that says, your account may have been compromised. And it gives the location, the Ukraine. That's a little scary, right? There's a lot of hackers there. And it says, we've stopped the attempt, but change your password. Click this link. Now, he had put together cybersecurity studies for the Obama administration. So this isn't the kind of person that's just going to click a link. He does the smart thing. He sends it to his chief of staff. Her problem now. She takes a look at it and says, well, I'm not a techie. She sends it to their head of IT security. All sounds right and proper, right? This happens on a Sunday morning. All within an hour, he gets a communication back from the head of security through his chief of staff. How does the communication come? In an email. The email says, mistakenly, it is a legitimate request. But go directly to this website in Gmail and change your password there. The IT guy later said he meant to say illegitimate. Podesta apparently sees the email, reads legitimate, goes right, doesn't read the rest, goes right back and clicks the link. Now the Russians have all of his emails from 2008 until that election. And there's some bad stuff in there. We don't need to go into it. But these are not the kind of things you want out in WikiLeaks, which you know, they're curated, they're dumped on WikiLeaks, and those reporters uh, were like, all right, now I'm going to make my name for myself going through all of this. Think about it for a second. Oh, by the way, one more point. It's uh, Fancy Bear is the name of the attacker who apparently drops this on WikiLeaks. So Sony attack, Guardians of Peace. DNC attack, Fancy Bear. Sony attack, using an email to fish and to attack, which is the vector that they got in. DN, uh, the DNC attack and John Podesta attack, same thing, email that they clicked on. Stole all the information and put it in the public for revenge. Stolen the information and put it in public on revenge. Russia wasn't even being, you know, sophisticated. Ru Russia was just using the 2014 North Korea playbook to attack the DNC. And they'll continue doing it. Um, looks like they've already tried to attack the Germans and the French. Uh, before us, it was the Ukraine. And this is the new normal. Because bad guys stay one step 
ahead of security, and they always have. And bad guys stay ahead of security. I mean, I'm preaching the choir here. You guys understand this because one of the tensions between crime and uh, law enforcement is that as we in law enforcement are dealing with a crime, we're often responding to it. Bad guy does something. We find out that it's happened. We find out how it happened. We conduct the forensics. We learn exactly what the... Um, the way that they did it, why they did it, how they did it. We put together the investigation, uh, hopefully catch the bad guy, and then we find a way to keep it from happening before. Uh, I'm sorry, again. The problem is that while all of this is happening, the sophisticated criminal has already moved on to the next vector of attack. This happens time and again in cybersecurity. I, I like to um, explain this. A better way to explain this is with terrorism. <clears throat> Remember that we had this problem in terrorism, uh, in counterterrorism is a lot of what I did in the FBI, with attackers parking trucks filled with bombs. We had a truck problem near buildings. Or sometimes driving them in the worst, first World Trade Center attack, remember, under the building. You know in that first attack, the only reason the tower didn't come down is because they parked in the wrong parking space. So we had this truck bombing problem. And so we organized all our efforts, built these things called Jersey Walls. That was the solution. And if you go to any government building uh, around the country and, and overseas, um, you will see very clever Jersey Walls, these, these concrete, steel-reinforced barriers that are at the exact distance where when that truck hits and it explodes, there's going to be an offset between the blast in the building and everyone inside will be okay. If you're out there for a smoke, not so much, but if you're inside, you're probably fine. And while we're doing all this, oh, by the way, go to FBI headquarters sometimes. They've got the best. Um, ugly building anyway. Sorry, FBI headquarters, but it's true. If you uh, go in the front where they have the marble facing, the facade, which actually looks nice, there are these humongous planters that have flowers in them. It looks real nice. Then you go to the, all the rest of the sides of the building, and it's like they either ran out of money or patience or time. And instead of planting nice flowers, they just fill it all with gravel. So whatever. Um, while this is happening, we're, we're putting all these nice planters with gravel around buildings, the attackers are thinking of the next wave of attacks. They're not wasting their time with truck bombs anymore. What do they do? They fly planes into buildings. Didn't see that coming. So we form the Department of Homeland Security. We unite all of our efforts in the intelligence law enforcement communities. Nobody can wear their shoes through metal detectors anymore. Um, you can't drop your friends off or meet them at the gate anymore. Uh, we change everything so that this can't happen again. This horrible, devastating attack cannot happen again. We react. What do the attackers do? They go back to trucks and they start driving them into crowds. Always reacting to be efficient in stopping these sort of attacks in cybersecurity or terrorism or simple crime. We need to think like attackers and be ahead of them forecast and think about what the next attack is going to be so we can be there before the attacker is there. And that is, how, that is the solution to the uh, enormous numbers of cyber attacks that are happening. What's the number one cyber attack today? Well, according to the FBI, if you look at the statistics from last year, a $1 billion crime that's looking to double or triple into this year, into 2017, it's ransomware. And ransomware was made famous by an attack called WannaCry. You know, um, I don't know who names these. I think it's the video game culture that names these. It's also the video game culture that usually designs the ransomware attacks. And ransomware attacks, um, while they're horrible and devastating, also lend themselves to a slight bit of hilarity only because those who are designing these attack vectors are a little bit like graffiti artists who have their, uh, who tag buildings. They have their, their special tag that they want, and so they design these way, things in a way that are very noticeable. So a little, a uh, few statistics about ransomware. As I said, uh, it is now the biggest cyber crime out there. If you want to think in terms of fraud, there is no better cyber attack that is fraud related than a ransomware attack um, because of the way that the attack is constructed, because of the way that it leverages usually an email communication that fools a person into clicking on a link or opening an attachment that loads the malware, the malicious software, that then installs the ransomware and locks down your computer. 
For those of you who have heard of ransomware but don't quite know how it works, basically what it does is it reaches into your computer and encrypts your drive. So all of your information is scrambled and can't be read unless you have a special key that decrypts it. And the attacker is the only person with that key. And unless you have a good backup, you are not going to get your data back. It's very difficult to decrypt if they use a very strong encryption. And you're probably not going to have the funds to pay someone to go through and decrypt it for you, even if it is possible, as that's very expensive. And the attackers, because ransomware is a business, are very nice. They're very helpful. You can even log into a chat room and speak with your attacker. So you receive a screen that says, you have been locked by ransomware. You will never get your information back. But good news, if you pay us in Bitcoin, we'll unlock your information. And you say, what the hell is a Bitcoin? And they'll explain what a Bitcoin is. And this is the link you go to, and here's how you buy Bitcoin, and here's how you transfer it um, anonymously to us so that we can send you back your decryption key. And you still have no clue. So it says, click here for chat room, and they'll explain it to you. Ransomware attackers have even become tech support. They've said, you're locked anyway. Give us access to your computer. We have all your files anyway. And we will decrypt everything for you. And they've reached out and done that. Because it's a business, they make a fortune off of ransomware attacks. If I ever wanted to go criminal, this would be my business. Because you don't even have to be a programmer. You can go onto the dark web and download a toolkit and become a ransomware attacker yourself. Don't do it, please. Bad thing to do. No, no, no. It, it, I always like to think of some clever vectors of ransomware. Here are a couple. The first is called popcorn. This is still my favorite. It's been my favorite for months. Popcorn puts you in this wonderful prisoner's dilemma. Well, it's a terrible prisoner's dilemma. Popcorn's like this, and they go after people who don't have a lot of money, college students, that kind of thing, people who are young and starting out. Uh, they only want a Bitcoin, maybe $150. And um, what it does is it locks your computer, and then like this popcorn pops, right? That's their you know, tagging. And then it says you can use the good uh, response to get your information decrypted or the evil response. The good response is you pay them a Bitcoin. The evil response is if you send it to your friends, they give you a link, to a, a, a link, and if you send this link to all your friends and two of them click and get locked by my ransomware and pay me, I'll unlock you for free. Now, don't raise your hands. How many people out there would think to themselves, hmm, who are the two people I hate the most? <laughs> and you can become a hacker. That's Papa. Resinware is the other one. Resinware is playing off the uh, Japanese anime culture. There's this uh, silly game called uh, Resin, and it's impossible. It's one of those arcadey things where you have to shoot up a screen. And it, it, believe me, it, unless you really love this stuff, you're dead in two seconds. Uh, it locks your computer installs the game and loads it on what's called lunatic level, which is, it was impossible to start. No one can do this. I think like three people have passed lunatic level and they live in other countries and you'd have to go find them through YouTube. Uh, you have to get two, 200 million points on lunatic level and you get unlocked for free. So you play a video game to get your data back or you have to pay them. So your choices are pay them, be really good at video games. Maybe you have a kid who could do it for you. Or uh, go find some guy in some uh, stand who is willing to fly over and unlock you. Not going to happen. So ransomware. Serious problem with, you know, solutions that we aren't quite figuring out yet. Um, you know, as I said, email is the number one vector of attack for ransomware. Uh, infected emails increased 6,000% using email as a vector from 2015 to 16. That means that email is so successful at fooling people that all the ransomware attackers just decided, this is the way I'm going to do it. 59% um, of infections last year came from email. And ransomware has future implications, especially because of that thing we call um, IoT, or the Internet of Things. You probably heard that terminology thrown out all the time. Some of you might have said, what is this Internet of Things thing? It's very simple. 
we're connecting our homes, our lives to the internet. Now remember earlier in this keynote when I said that the internet is the most insecure form of communication ever developed? That's because it was never developed for defense. It was developed to share. And when you develop something just to share, it's very hard to create defense around it. That's why cybersecurity is, I, I think, the, the number one future um, industry in terms of money that's going to be poured into it. It's because we are linking our lives to this very inefficiently uh, uh, communications device in terms of security. Internet of Things is like your refrigerator is connected because you want to see when you're out of milk or your doorbell is connected because you want to be able to see on your smartphone when someone rings your doorbell or you have security cameras in your home that are sending you emails every time there's movement. Um, your air conditioner, my, my air conditioner is, con is connected. That's an Internet of Things so that when uh, my wife and I and my kids are on our way home, uh, we can set the thermostat exactly where we want it, so an hour out, so it's nice and cool when we get into our house in the summer. All of that can be exploited. And ransomware is something that scares me for future exploits. So imagine this. You're in your home early one morning. This is next year. Could happen. And you're late. You got your suit on, you're ready to go, it's a huge day at the office, the biggest client ever is coming in, you've got the most important pitch, or you've been late like four or five times and you're going to be fired if you're late one more time. You get in your car, you take your thumb, you put it against the infotainment system to start your car up, and it doesn't start up. Your infotainment system says you have been locked with ransomware, and your self-driving car won't drive you to work. So what do you do? Do you call whatever Geek Squad tech support if the future is going to show up to get your car running? Or do you pay the ransom so you can get into the office for this incredibly important meeting? You probably pay the ransom. How about this one? It's a Saturday. You have nowhere to go. You're cool in your, in your smart home. And you go to leave, I don't know, to go for a jog or something. Your door won't open because your IoT locks are all locked. And, and you, you're afraid to open the windows because the alarm system, and you're thinking, this is fine. I'll call somebody. I'll hang out in my house until they come and fix this problem. And then your stereo system across the entire house goes up to the highest decibel possible, and it's playing, let it go. <laughs> That's right. That many people have kids. I have two daughters, and if I never hear that song again, I will be ecstatic. I would pay that ransom, and I, I, would be, I would be buying Bitcoin so fast to pay that ransom to stop that, you can't imagine. Because I can guarantee you, my kids would be just singing it at the top of their lungs, too. If you ever played karaoke with my uh, youngest daughter, that's the only song you get to sing. And so yes, ransomware, uh, you know, we laugh, but it has these feature implications. It is the biggest cybercrime, and it is growing. Uh, the only reason that WannaCry which infiltrated over 300,000 computers across 150 countries, was stopped is because the attack vector had a kill switch. And a researcher found it, which means if you registered it to a website, it would self-destruct. WannaCry leveraged a, uh, not a flaw in Windows, but part of the Windows operating system that if you didn't patch it, allowed uh, the malware to jump from operating system to operating system. It was what we call a worm, like a true virus. It would infect anyone that was connected. We were able to stop it, not me personally, but um, law enforcement and security is able to stop it. But there are additional attack vectors also stolen from the NSA, by the way, um, and the CIA that are out there and are going to be proliferated. So if you don't have cybersecurity, they're going to get you. So with that, what are some of the things you can do? Well, I'd like to talk about three, three things in terms of what you can do um, in acting and not reacting to the problem, in getting ahead of the attackers. Technology, people, and process. Three things. Technology means that you have good cybersecurity. Cybersecurity that focuses, for example, on the endpoint, that piece of technology like your phone or your laptop or your server or um, thumb drives, those things that are closest to the human that is going to be fooled. And you leverage what's called zero trust. 
Zero trust is like having the best club in Hollywood. And in that club, no one's getting in past that big mean bouncer. It doesn't matter how good you look or how well healed you are, no one gets past. And uh, only those people who are on the list, only those programs, those executables that you want to run can run on your system, which is why you look at the endpoint, because if it can't run there, it is not going to spread. That's how you stop malware and non-malware attacks, right? This technology. People, you have to have people who understand the technology. If you don't have people who understand how your technology works, who can conduct forensics, who have visibility and analytics into what's happening, it's all a waste of time. And finally, process. Process is about training people. It's learning not to click on links, not to be John Podesta, not to open attachments that come from people you don't know. But it's also learning that fraudsters are out there and that we have to be aware in order to stop them. Everybody here knows about the CEO attack, where every, you know, certain people in an organization get an email, it purportedly comes from the CEO, and it says, there's a crisis, you have to wire money to this account immediately, or everything will go wrong and we're going to crash and burn and all lose our jobs. That pressure situation, and people will unfortunately do it. Um, we all know that you train people. When you get that email, if you think it might be legitimate, pick up the phone, Remember those things? And call the CEO. It's okay to do that. CEO has to be cool with getting those calls. Might stop massive fraud. So that training is important. Technology, people, and process, that training. And so with that, a bit about cybersecurity and ransomware and all of the changes in espionage, I'm going to leave you with the final story about how we caught Robert Hansen. So, we had been going after him for a number of months, building a mousetrap within the FBI headquarters in order to catch him, and I was placed as his aide. So I was always looking for that way to get to determine whether he was a spy when we finally did how to catch him. The thing about criminals that we all know here, especially in the world of fraud examination, is that they have routines. Criminals do things over and over to protect themselves. We all do this, right? Um, you might have a security badge to get in and out of your building. And that security badge is, you, you know, useful, other than you have to call security and they have to come down and get you. And when you are done for the day, you probably put it in one pocket or one part of your bag so you don't forget it the next morning. Or you hang your keys on the same hook every time you get home. If you don't, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, especially my wife, where you can never find her keys and we're always going through hunts for them because she doesn't have that routine. Hansen had a routine. He had a Palm Pilot. Remember those things? Right. It was really cool because it was a digital calendar and you used to have to tap things into it with a stylus. So he had a Palm Pilot. It was always in his left back pocket. And every time he sat down, he'd pull it out of his pocket, put it in his bag. And when he stood up, like clockwork, it would go right back into his pocket. Always, every time when he sat at his desk. That's a routine. So I asked him about it. So what's the story with that Palm Pilot? And he said, Anyone who wants to be an efficient executive must have one of these devices. I note you don't have a device, so you will always be a worthless do-nothing clerk. I thought, okay, got that. So we worked ostensibly for the Office of Science and Technology in the FBI on the overt part of the job. So I went to the chief scientist and I said, I'd like to requisition two Palm Pilots. And since the Palm 5 is out, let me have two of them. He said, why, why do you need a Palm? And I said, well, I'd like one for myself and one for my boss. And I would like to no longer be a do-nothing worthless clerk and become an executive one day. And he kind of laughed and said, that's good enough for me, I'll give you two. I offered one to uh, Robert Hansen and he looked at me and he said, I don't want it, take it back. I like mine. I've written the encryption on this myself and these idiots, his words, not mine, at the FBI couldn't ever crack my encryption. We know that the FBI, now we know the FBI can actually crack encryption, but that's another story. That's a clue, ladies and gentlemen. That's a routine and a clue. So we said, we have to get that Palm Pilot from him. And this is where shenanigans come in, which is a covert operational term. We had to remove Hansen from his Palm Pilot long enough for me to get it down to a tech team so they could copy it and find the information on it before he realized it was gone. And so that's what we did. We had an assistant director and another guy who were read into the case come in and unannounced. 
walk over to Hanson's desk. Now, I made sure they came in when he was sitting down, wouldn't do for him to be standing up. And they walk over, and the assistant director slaps $20 on the desk, looks Hanson in the eye and says, you and me, shooting range now, and I'll bet you this 20, five times out of five, I hit that target better than you do. The shooting range is in the basement of FBI headquarters, and we're up on the ninth floor in room 9930. Hanson doesn't want to. He, he doesn't like uh, to be challenged. He doesn't like authority at all. I think he would have only been happy if he was FBI director, the way he spoke. And he certainly didn't like to be interrupted, and he was in the middle of a nice monologue toward me. So he's frustrated. He's flustered. We broke his routine. And so he gets up and he grabs his firearm out of the desk and he grabs his ear protection and eye protection and he stomps off after this grinning assistant director and for the first time, he forgets his Palm Pilot. This was significant because in the movie Breach, Ryan Philby can do this all the first time he tries. In real life, it sometimes took me a few tries to get him to do things. So finally, there's the Palm Pilot. I open all the pockets of the bag. I go through it. I find the Palm Pilot and I find a Versa data disk, a, a data disk that had been important earlier in the case. Figure we'll copy that again too. And I run down three flights of steps to where there's a tech team who had been waiting for weeks, hand off the devices and wait. And as they're in there copying it one to one, they said, oh, it's heavily decrypted. We're just gonna copy it and decrypt it later. I get a page on my Skytel alphanumeric two-way pager Remember those? The only people who had them were drug dealers and FBI agents. And I wasn't allowed to tell my family what I did, so you know what they thought? Made dating interesting. And it says, out of pocket, probably coming to you. Uh oh. Now, it's not like James Bond movie or Jack Bauer. I get the devices, the Palm Pilot and the, and the data card. I run up three flights of steps. I get in the room. I get to the bag. And I've got a good, like, three minutes before Hanson's supposed to be back. I knew it took him about nine minutes to limp up from the shooting range if he got the elevator first time all the way up to the ninth floor. In How many FBI people do we have in the audience who have been at FBI headquarters? Some. Whoever designed that place, it makes no freaking sense. I mean, I got lost the first time I walked in there for this investigation. So there's a circuitous route. It's like a labyrinth to get where you want to go. So I knew I had some time. I kneel down in front of the bag. I'm feeling really good about myself. Operation successful. And I realize I've opened four pockets, and there are two devices. And I can't for the life of me remember where they came from. So I'm literally trying to self-hypnotize and see myself, you know, 13 minutes ago pulling the stuff out of the bag, and I hear him coming through the door of the skiff where we worked. So I just dropped, dropped, zipped all four pockets, ran back to my desk, sat there, and put the best poker face I've ever had in my life, the last best poker face I've ever had, and looked at him as he came in. He glares at me, goes past me into his office, and slams the door. And I hear, zip. And I thought to myself, now would be a good time to run. He's armed and I'm not. Probably don't want to be here because there's no way I got the po pocket wrong. I, I, I spoke in front of a group of physicists once and I said, I'm not sure what the math is, but the odds aren't good. Someone stood up and rattled it right off. If anybody can do this, uh, that I'll be really impressed. I don't remember. But it ain't good. You don't go to uh, Vegas with those odds. But I sat there thinking to myself, look, if I'm not here when he comes out, I've ruined this investigation because he has to be pushed so far into from suspicion to paranoia right now that I will blow this case. I have to be here. I have to make an excuse. And he came out and he glares right at me. And he says, were you in my office? And I said, yeah, boss, I was in there. I put a memo in your inbox. Didn't you see it? What's the problem? He looks at me and says, I don't want you in my office ever again. He leaves for the day. So, a few days later, he's on that bridge. He's feeling real good about himself, smiling. He walks off the bridge and he retraces his steps in a sort of lurching gait. He reaches his car, his silver Ford Taurus, pulls the keys out of his pocket, 
He goes to put them in the ignition, and FBI SWAT vans screech to a halt. Armed FBI agents jump out, point automatic weapons at him. So they drop the keys, he does, raises his hand, says the guns are not necessary. <clears throat> and he is arrested for espionage, pleads guilty, and will spend the rest of his life in Supermax Prison in Florence, Colorado. On that data card, we had the letters that he had written to the FBI's in that last drop to the Russians. And on the Palm Pilot, we not knew, only knew the day that he would make the drop, but the time and where he would do it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you catch a spy. Thank you.